Hi again, everybody. It's David Collins with BitNote, where we'll be playing video game music and talking about the games they're from. Hope you enjoy. So, before I begin with the uh, video game music and talking about the games thereof, I would like to let everyone know that the uh, podcast and the entire set of episodes for BitNote are available for download on dublinsouthfm.ie. Yep, that's right. I uploaded all the episodes, uh, marked them all with the RSS feed so it can all, can all be set up with a podcast. And so you can listen to it online on the website or just download them as an MP3. Or you can just, if you've got a podcast system set up on your computer or a mobile device or iPod or whatever, you can set it up to uh, with the uh, Dublin South FM to constantly get the latest episode of BitNote whenever they come out. So, um, if you want to listen to any past episodes or keep on keep track with future episodes, remember to go to dublinsouthfm.ie. I've also got a new Twitter feed, right, at uh, bitnotefm. So, it's twitter.com forward slash bitnotefm, all just one big word. I couldn't choose bitnote because some guy had already taken that, but bitnotefm. And uh, there's a link to that Twitter account on the uh, BitNote page on the Dublin South FM website. So if you just remember Dublin South FM, it should all just work out for you if you go to the BitNote page. So you can go to there for the latest updates on BitNote and what's coming up. Uh, But for now, let's start off with our first song. Thank you. 
that, my friends, I think you'll agree, is an amazing song. It is from the video game Ico, which was released back in 2002 on the PlayStation 2. It is a beautiful game in its own way, and um, it was developed by Team Ico. As you can see, they got their name where they got their name from. And uh, it was composed by Michiru Oshima, with vocals by Stephen Garagati, who is of Libra, which is Libra is like an English uh, boys' choir group. He is a former member of that. So, um, Ico, boy, um, there's a lot of background to this game. Uh, let's start off. Th- let's start off with the basics. Ico is a game that's nearly always brought up whenever there's a games art, art discussion or debate going on. Now, I know what some of you might be saying, well, what's this about games or art? Well, essentially in gaming circles or online circles or basically places where games are discussed, the question about the whole are games art is discussed. Now, to be honest, I've always felt this is kind of a... Well, to me, it seems pretty wrapped up from the beginning. I mean, games contain expression. Games involve people creating something that'll allow people to experience something. And I mean, if you've listened to their shows, there's countless different experiences, countless different varieties, countless different methods and styles and genres. I mean, of course, this is about people expressing themselves. So, you know, are games art? Well, of course they are. I mean, why wouldn't they be, is my personal thing. But I mean, I don't really see it as an issue because... To me, art is basically self-expression. But the problem is, it's not that simple. For a start, there are a couple of like people who claim that games aren't art. There's this a famous American movie critic who's played like two games in his life and said the games aren't art, and that gets everyone riled up because apparently... But really, the problem is more that what they feel that games aren't getting the attention they deserve. That's, that's really what the games are art is about. When they say art, they don't mean does it express something that lets people on the other fa- side feel emotion. They mean... Is it something that can really move people, change people's lives, be seen in art galleries, analysed, discussed, everything else? Well, to be brutally honest, if you even take the cursory glance of any gaming blog out there, you'll know there's a ton of stuff you can discuss about games and debate and talk about the messages here and there. So there's no argument in that respect. In terms of adoption by people, well, yeah, I suppose a lot of people do, you know, especially a lot of people do, don't quite understand games or, or have, you know, basic bias prejudice, you know, biases or their own, their own, like, uh, basic impressions to what games are. And to them, I say, well, it's understandable. I mean, I don't pretend to have an encyclopedic knowledge of every subject in this world, especially things I'm not interested in. So if someone's just not into video games and just thinks that they're just the things that you see on, like, box shelves with guys shooting each other and blips and blobs, well, well, of course they're going to think that. You know, they just haven't really had the experience to think otherwise. And, of course, in those circumstances, maybe you could introduce them to games, and it's very hard to choose the right game just to really introduce someone. Or maybe you could discuss games, or you could do a bunch of things just to try to express your point of view, and maybe they'll take it on board, maybe they won't. It's like pretty much every single other thing in life, pretty much. But um, games, but the games in art tends to rear its head every so often and it's trying to make games being respectable. But it's also does another interesting aspect which I actually really do approve of. There also tends to be an argument about are games expressing enough? Are are there enough artistic expression? You know, c- could games be doing more? Could games there's a constantly recurring question of could games make people cry? Now the whole now of course there was a game called Final Fantasy VII which a lot of people claimed made them cry so I don't know why people are still asking that question but the whole idea is that they're saying can we move games forward or or in my idea can we widen the scope of games can we expand their emotional breadth and I mean if people are thinking that I think awesome because yeah I mean video games it's like any medium they develop they expand and they sort of get caught up in its own boundaries especially the mainstream stuff I mean if you're creating a game that costs like 20 million dollars or pounds just just to budget it and then on top of that marketing you need to make sure it's going to sell so you're not going to take gigantic risks I mean you'd want to choose something that at least has a decent chance of selling all of units so especially in mainstream gaming there's a lot of things in indie gaming you know independent gaming there's more experimentation but still people are unsure and they tend to go with old with old standbys and i mean it's like pretty much every media out there you know a lot of people try to you know do a version of what's gone before put their own thing and that that's fine but i mean i always just really but you know sometimes people get stuck and i always love new experiences that's that's something that really gets to me if i can if i can just you know, pick up something and listen or watch or something that'll give me something that, you know, I haven't seen before, have tried before, or makes me think in a different way. Because I think that just constant stimulation, constant new things is vital for like, 
for, for like keeping our mind flexible and considering new ideas and thinking and seeing things from new experience and getting stimulated. I mean, you know, if you were just living in some small little place somewhere and didn't see anything of the outside world, think of how narrow minded you'd be. The whole the whole reason that we, I believe that we've got an open-minded civilization here is because we see so many different things. And the key to being open-minded is to just constantly find out new stuff that you had no idea about before and just challenge yourself to think different ways. And so, in that respect, I think that video games that try new boundaries or push new extents, you know, are great in that respect. Um, I suppose um, one of my examples, I suppose, is... a. Uh, which I think is Braid. Now, Braid is an interesting example. I've played music from it before because while it technically does a lot of what's done before, platforming game game uh, Mario influences, the guy who was developing it had a very much games or art mindset and he, by going with that, he ended up having beautiful visuals and really thought out techniques and he also had some interesting gameplay elements involving the manipulation of time and some nice, weird, you know, um, abstract story elements so when all that was put together you end up getting a really interesting experience and i just and overall i just really enjoyed playing the game so i mean if the games or art crowd is going to lead to people trying new things and people to experiment or people to just try have a little fun time and just think of things that haven't been thought before and feel that it's okay for them to do so then yeah sure go ahead but if they're just going to say games are art and everyone's going to think, you know, oh, games of art are this sort of game or that sort of game, you know, then then it's just going against itself. Because, like I said, um, art can be just... A lot of people have their own definition of art, which makes the debate even more tricky. But um, my definition of art is always self-expression. So if you're, if you're changing what you want to express because you think people would prefer to hear something else, then you're going down a tricky path. And I think you'll usually find if you express what you want to express, it'll be far more truthful and far more unique and more interesting as a result. Okay, um, I just realized I've spent a whole time talking about games or art and completely forgot to talk about the game Ico itself. Oh, sugar. Um, I'll tell you what, why not play one more track from Ico and uh, just to break it up and we'll get right back into that, okay? <laughs> a very relaxing track from of course once again Ico so um, what's Ico about essentially you are a boy who was born with horns and the villagers took exception to this so on your 12th uh, 12th birthday you were given to a bunch of horned horsemen that just popped up in the town and they took you away and locked you in this castle kind of not a nice start really through a bit of chance actually you manage to escape and then you meet up when you're exploring the castle you suddenly find this girl called Yorda who you know I figure out from near the end of the game and uh, she was basically trapped and you release her and then suddenly you go on this journey to escape the castle pretty much so what most of the ca- escaping the castle does is that you'll be in this usually beautifully area and there'll be some switches here and maybe some crates to push and you basically you and Yorda have to go around the environment just try to figure out what to push where to what thing to open whether and then 
and uh, just basically it's largely a puzzle and sort of platformer as you figure out what gets you through the environment. And the game is usually very clever in keeping things diverse as you climb and jump and crawl and lay a few bombs around here and blow stuff up and everything. And it's just, it's very creative as you navigate the castle inside and outside and up and down and around. And of course, you've got to make sure that Yorda comes with you the whole time. On top of this, you've also got a bunch of these shadow monsters, these shades that start attacking you and you have to fight back. So when I put it like that, the game seems fairly standard. You know, you rescue a girl and then you just fight, and fight off monsters and, puzzle, and navigate a puzzle. So why is the game considered a great example of games or art? Well, to be honest, I'm trying to ask myself the same question and I'm really apologised to all those games or art people out there. But I just, I mean... Let's face it, for a start, the characters weren't that interesting, and Yorda kind of really annoyed me. I mean, the whole point, the idea, and what some people playing the game actually experience is that they developed a relationship with Yorda. I mean, this is a game where holding her hand is a key gameplay mechanic. It's the only way you can quickly move across with her. Otherwise, you have to call her and she'll make up her own mind whether she follows you or not. And she can't actually do anything. She can't fight. She gets captured by the monsters. You don't die when the monsters kill you. You die when the monsters take her away into these black sinkholes you have to either pull her out of very quickly. So, in other words... I mean, when I first rescued her, we were on this, like, ledge. It was a small drop, but nothing much. I said, okay, so it looks like we're in this together, you know. And then we walked along, and Yorda slipped and fell and off the ledge. And I was going, okay, is this going to sum up our entire relationship for the rest of this game? And it pretty much was. You do have to hugely babysit Yorda. And, I mean, to be honest, it's almost... I mean, I don't like going into all sex and or whatever thing, but, I mean, it's like the archetypical relationship of the strong male that must protect this weak defenseless female from all the monsters and i mean the idea was this 12 year old you know Iko was meant to fall in love or or you know not even love just build up a relationship with this yorda but it's just i was thinking damn it i don't know what you see in her but, but she's damn well annoying i mean you know if it weren't for these single doors which only she can open for whatever reason you know um you could pretty much make through the entire game without her help I mean, that's just how it is. Or at least tell her to wait. I mean, you can't even leave her alone. If you leave her and go into the next room, then sooner or not the shade monsters capture and you have to rescue her again. So there's that. Aiko is pretty standard. He's he's a nice guy. And um, there isn't really many other characters beside that. No, I'll get into. But so, so, I mean, it's... And I mean, I think a lot of people say it's simplistic as in boy meets girl was the idea. But I mean, like, we all know that boy meets girl is one of the most tired concepts there. And... What new did it bring? But I'm being extremely unfair. There is some beautiful things to the game, and that's the art style, which I believe a lot of other games things. When you look at the castle, it actually looks beautiful. It's like an impressionist painting. The stu- the, stu- the stuff done by uh, Monet and Manet and stuff, where they would well, okay, Monet really, where they'd like take it like this picture of light on haystacks or light on a cathedral face and then just keep painting it at various different times of the day each time experimenting with how the light bounces off of it and glows and I mean this is pretty much what the game does the the castle looks beautiful the way that light bounces off or casts deep shadows I mean or or and and you know the and it's diverse I mean when I said there weren't good characters in the game there is one great character and that's the actual castle itself I mean, I just love the idea of navigating an area that um, where you where you basically, and you know, seeing one part. And I mean, you could be walking go walking along the castle and go outside. As you look into the distance, you can see this other part of the castle you were at before. I love these sort of games where you get a real sense of the actual layout of the place, where there's geography, where it's not just a set of like rooms linked up with corridors that you do in a linear fashion. Which this ge- I mean, this game kind of is that, but it's it weaves all around this really fully realized environment. So it's kind of funny the first time I was up in this high tower and looked out across the castle and all its shapes, and the way that the sun. I mean, it had a beautiful effect here. The way the sun sun like reflect off the mist so that the further in the distance things went the, the fainter and more indistinct the uh, scenery became till it was like silhouettes I just I just believed that I just loved that effect and the way that bright sun and everything and so you know we'd navigate the castle and look around and you see some interesting chambers and there's a windmill at one point and some beautiful effects so when you're trying to do all this puzzling and moving blocks and trying to figure out when to climb chains and how the heck to get your order from where from her place to over where you are because you just climbed a chain and she can't do that it's just beautiful this whole environment which really comes alive and which 
which which really has a life to it, and I loved. So yeah, I mean, I did love a lot of aspects to Ico. I just didn't like the whole game itself, and like I said, the core mechanics of the game weren't that I wasn't I found interesting, but wasn't you know falling head over heels with or anything. And Yorda, like I said, um, okay, so I've got this basic ball and chain which I have to drag through most of the game, and doesn't usually provide any extra challenge to the puzzles, but you know. It happens, and it's still a good game, and uh, like I said, it's simple. Now, um, if you want, recently, uh, Ico has been re-released, has a HD release for the PlayStation 3. And uh, it's also uh, got also Team Ico's second game, Shadow of the Colossus, which I haven't played, but I hear also tends to get the uh, game's art accolades. So when I play that, I'm sure I'll have a whole load of fun little comments to make about that. Actually, or maybe I'll just spare you and just say, you know, whether it was good or bad or whatever, and then I'll just play the song and then move on to a game that doesn't have me ranting around for countless amounts of time. But um, yes, Ico made by Team Ico. And to be honest, I had a good time playing it. It's just that when pe- when something is vaunted to be some great artistic symbol and something that everyone should stare around and look at, it's just very high expectations to live up to. So let's move from a game that had like was highly revered and with high expectations to one that basically most people haven't heard of. And it's pretty nice in it. The game is Confidential Mission, and let's just play the first track from the background of the music of the first mission. And as I said before, that was from Confidential Mission, developed by Sega. And the music there was by Siichiro Matsumura. Now, Confidential Mission is um, it's a light gun game, basically. So I've just gone from a pretty deep artistic game to probably one of the most simplistic games you can get. But it's kind of a bit of fun. It's actually made around the same time. And I know it's for and released in the Sega Dreamcast and arcades. Essentially, um, it took the virtual cop formula, which was basically you were a cop and you, all these bad guys shot up and then pop up and you have to shoot them. And with an actual physical plastic gun in your hand of course you know aiming at the screen and everything and uh, this one uh, took the virtual cop format including the glowy wrecked targets that suddenly appear over the enemies and turned into basically more of a sort of a James Bond not quite spoof but sort of like themed idea so essentially you are a secret agent working for the working for an agency and essentially there's this evil organization called Argus and so essentially um, you basically go in all these crazy places to uh, try to defeat them so like the first level takes place in this museum with all the bad guys popping up and you have to shoot them down and then you use all these spy gadgets like a grappling hook to, to do a zip line down across and then there's the next level, which takes place in a in a train traveling through a snowy wasteland. And of course, you've got all these guys on um on these little snowmobiles trying to jump, fly after you, and shoot you with machine guns and everything. And then, of course, you've got the last level, which, of course, as you know, if you know anything about Bond movie themes, takes place in a gigantic secret lair. And there's a satellite involved, which apparently is going to rain down destruction or something. So essentially, it's pretty much a bit of a fun game. Um, it wasn't my favorite. Uh, it wasn't my. Fa- it was kind of funny with the Sega Dreamcast. I basically uh, bought this light gun to play as the Dead 2, and then I was anxious. Let's see what other great light guns guns came come out for this machine. 
you see, as you know, you have to actually buy a whole physical plastic gun. You can play with the joypad, but no one really ever should, because the whole point of a light gun game is that you aim the gun at the screen, and when you pull the trigger, that exact point of the screen suddenly has a hit mark, and anything at that point of the screen just falls down or whatever. So I would bought it for House of the Dead 2, which was fun and blasting zombies, and it turned out Confidential Mission was the only other game for the Sega Dreamcast that actually also supported the light gun. So... Great investment there, like buy a peripheral that's going to work with two games. And of course, then this Dreamcast went bankrupt and couldn't even use this. It was kind of irritating too, because I mean, like I even like the Ligon came with a D-pad, you know, like a small little directional pad. And I even read in dream in, in previews about this game called, um, I think, Bite the Bullet, where you'd actually be able to move your character around using the D-pad and then aim at the screen and shoot at enemies. And I was really excited for that. But that never did happen. Um... When the Wii came out, something kind of like that happened in terms of Red Steel, but it's just not the same. It's just, you know, there's, you know, Wii is about moving a reticle around on the screen using motion sense, but um, with the light gun, you know, it was just, you aimed at the screen and either you, it went where you aimed it or you missed and everything. It's kind of funny because the light gun genre was kind of dying out around the time the Sega Dreamcast was. I mean, this is this this is a genre that had some great luminaries. I mean, there was the original Area 51, which a lot of people played. But of course, and um, of course, the whole Virtual Cop series, which was like really awesome at the time because like everything was in 3D. And when you shot an enemy, it would fall down in 3D and whoa. And then, of course, there was a Time Crisis series where basically you had a pedal and you'd press. And whenever you press down on the pedal, because a lot of these light guns were more arcade territory, whenever you press down on the pedal, somehow your character would jump up from cover. You'd be able to shoot all the enemies, release the pedal and drop down again. And then there was an interesting game called Police 24-7, where it actually was able to like monitor, it was actually able to t- sense your body position. This was before motion sensing peripherals like the Kinect had come into vogue. And so what would happen was, it was like Time Crisis, except by ducking down and actually moving your body from side to side, you would be able to dodge bullets and stuff and then just shoot back. So you duck back and forth by cover and you'd hope that every time you duck from cover to shoot the enemy, that it wouldn't be a bullet, wouldn't just fly right into your head and everything. So it was really... Then, of course, there was the Sniper Scope series, which is really interesting. I mean, technically not fully a light gun game, but basically you had a gigantic sniper scope and you aimed it at the screen. And the cool thing was, when you looked through the actual scope, there'd be another screen that would show a zoomed in section of whatever you're pointing at. So it's like really simulating a light gun. So, I mean, when you look at it, you know, is this really a great idea to have people going? And, of course, Duck Hunt. How could I freaking forget Duck Hunt? Yes, the original Nintendo thing. That's what most kids growing up around that time were knew as light gun games. They knew it was a great big plastic orange and grey zapper shooting at birds while a freaking dog sniggers at you. Practically everyone remembers this Duck Hunt and being bundled with Mario Brothers in a single cart and just playing that game with a zapper and everything. And yeah, that, that was a whole generation of light gun games right there. But um... As much as I'd like to go on, it's time to wrap up the show. So this has been David Collins with BitNote. I'm going to leave you with with the ending theme from Confidential Mission. And remember, we're on DublinSouthFM.ie for podcasts and BitNote FM on Twitter. Thank you very much. This has been David Collins with BitNote. Thank you for listening.